Well, I'm, I'm taking as my text this morning, uh, Mark chapter one, verses one through eight, uh, which is a, a text that was read this morning uh, at our in-person service, but I'd like to read it again just so that it's fresh in our minds. Mark chapter one, verses one through eight. If you have a, a, a text, and I think actually we're going to project it. Uh, I want to invite you to follow along uh, with me. Mark chapter one, beginning at verse one, verses one through eight. In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with the camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so uh, today is the second Sunday in the season of uh, Advent, uh, which is uh, which is this uh, season of the Christian year that begins uh, some four Sundays uh, before the 12 days of Christmas. And to, so today is the second Sunday uh, within the season of, of Advent. And so th this morning, I want to talk on this subject, the message of Advent. And the overarching message of the season of Advent seems to be, be prepared. Be prepared. Interestingly enough, in, in, in years uh, gone by, it was only the liturgical churches, the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran churches, uh, the Anglican Church that observed the traditional season of uh, Advent. Uh, now, however, uh, even many of the free churches and, uh, and, and uh, denominations, the Baptist Church and uh, community uh, uh, churches, uh, now appear to be observing uh, the season of Advent in, in one form or another. And, and perhaps that's because of the uh, ever-increased uh, commercialization of Christmas or perhaps uh, even the ever-increased secularization of Christmas, in which um, uh, even the mention of Christ's name at Christmas time uh, is considered by some to be inappropriate, insensitive, and to some uh, evenly highly offensive. And so even the, these uh, churches that otherwise don't follow the, the can calendar of the, of the Christian year uh, have felt it necessary, it, it seems, to do something, perhaps to uh, reinsert a spiritual focus back into this time uh, that uh, that leads up to Christmas Day. And observing Advent, it seems, uh, works well in that regard. Uh, but, but what about it? What about Advent? A indeed, if the overarching message of Advent is be prepared, in particular, that is to be prepared for the Lord when he comes, Indeed, the word Advent, the English word Advent, comes from the Latin Adventus, which means coming or, or appearing. How are we to prepare for that? How are we to prepare for the Lord's Advent or his coming again? Well, that's where John the Baptist comes in. Uh, and this is why uh, John figures large uh, in the season of Advent every year. The Old Testament scriptures told us that he was coming. And, and it's John, John is the one who tells us that Jesus is coming and that we need to be prepared for him when he does. But, but how are we to prepare? How are we to prepare for his coming? Well, John says very simply, he says, repent. And, and so I want us to look at uh, three things uh, about repentance. Three things about repentance. And, and the first is, is that repentance is about transformation of life. That repentance is about transformation of life. Indeed, notice again verse four. And John appeared, 
baptizing in the wilderness, that's the, the wilderness of Judea, uh, just to the south and east of Jerusalem. And of course, we know he baptized at the Jordan River. It's interesting that the Jordan River at its closest point to, to uh, Jerusalem is still 20 miles away. And so people coming from uh, from Jerusalem would have had to travel quite a ways to get to hear John and be baptized by him. But anyway, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness. That's the wilderness of Judea and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, to, to repent literally means to change your mind. That's what that's what it literally means. The Greek word is metanoia. Uh, literally, it means to think again, or what we, how we would put it is to change your mind, and, and not just to change our minds uh, in the, as a in the sense of mere mental assent, like oh, okay, you know, uh, but repentance rather means uh, to change your mind in such a way that leads to a change of life, a transformation of life. That once I'm going in this direction, and when I repent, I change my mind. And to, to repent is to change the course of my life. And so, so repentance, be, while repentance begins with a, a, a change of mind, it's a radical change of mind that leads naturally to a radical change of life. And repentance, so-called, that doesn't, doesn't result in a radical change of life is not repentance in the way that the Bible defines and describes repentance. And so John says that the way for us to prepare to meet Christ when he comes is to begin with repentance. That is to, to take an honest look at our life, for you to take a look and for me to take a look, uh, to identify our sins. What are the shortcomings, the, the, the things we know are wrong? The way we handle this situation or that might be something that's habitual that we do, that we need to address that God doesn't find acceptable. God wants to help us with, to help us overcome it. And then to confess, and not only confess, because sometimes if we're in a habitual situation, we confess it and then go on doing it. Uh, but to confess and to reject those sins, and then to pursue a new way of living, and not just thinking about it, but doing it, because repentance is about transformation of life. And so that's the first thing. Secondly, repentance is about the forgiveness of sins. Notice again verses 4 and 5. And John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan. And doing what? This is really interesting. Confessing their sins <laughs> before, they, before they were baptized. I, I imagine uh, um, uh, John said, and so what sins do you have to, uh, to confess? What sins are you leaving behind as you engage in, in repentance, as you change your mind and, and change the course of your life? And they were, they were confessing their sins uh, to John. Indeed, the forgiveness is uh, one of the things, and, and finding forgiveness, by the way. Forgiveness is one of the things that's signified for us in the sacrament of baptism as we're talking about baptism. The idea of spiritual cleansing uh, and, and forgiveness or release. In fact, uh, the, the word forgiveness in the Greek literally means release. Uh, it was used uh, in, uh, in financial and e e economic settings uh, when you were released of a debt. Uh, and so, in fact, uh, well, at least one of the versions of the a Lord's Prayer, we forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Uh, and, and so to, to, to release some, someone uh, of debt or God releasing us uh, of a debt that we owe to him because um, we have sinned, we've broken his law, and, and therefore we're obligated and, and liable uh, for it. Uh, and so spiritual cleansing, uh, release, uh, a fresh start, certainly. Uh, central uh, to baptism and and that of heading in a new direction a new life with God and it's repentance and confession that result in forgiveness indeed uh, uh, not John the Baptist but John the Apostle uh, in his first letter that we have toward the end of uh, uh, of our New Testament 
and his first letter, 1 John chapter 1, and verses 8 and 9. In fact, you may not know wh where, where this is in the Bible, but I'm guessing that you probably have heard it. 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9. And, and John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I think, by the way, it's really interesting, and I think we need to be careful. I find uh, not a few people in the church who are willing to say, oh, well, you know, we're all sinners. That's not confession. <laughs> uh, first of all, confession is not confessing other people's sins. Confession is confessing your own uh, and, and being particular about it. It's not enough just to say, oh, well, you know, nobody's perfect. That's, that's not confession. Uh, that's that's um, that, that's to evade uh, the issue at hand. But it says he says here, if we say we have no sins, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is in, not in us. But verse nine, if we confess our sins, the word confess literally in the Greek means to say the same thing. When I confess my sins, what I'm doing is I'm saying the same thing about my sins that God says about them. I'm not making excuses for them. I'm identifying what they are, and I'm saying to God, God, you and I both know this is this is not good. This is not right. It's not good for me. It's not good for others. Uh, and, and you have called me to better and higher things. But here he says, if we confess, if we say the same thing uh, to, to God about our sins, if we confess our sins, God is faithful. <laughs> God is faithful and just to forgive us, to release us, of our sins, and here, notice the the the, uh, the uh, metaphor to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Indeed, forgiveness is critical because God knows that we need forgiveness in order to move forward. God knows that we need forgiveness in order. It's a great gift. A wonderful gift that I, I don't think uh, we always take advantage of because we're not willing to confess. <laughs> but God knows that we can't move forward in life, in the Christian life, without forgiveness. I heard Tony Evans say something uh, uh, in one of his talks on the radio. He said, Satan knows if, if he can keep us looking backward, he can keep us from moving forward. That's a great, that's a, that's a great uh, uh, line. That Satan knows that if he can keep us looking backward, he can keep us from moving forward. And oftentimes when we're looking back, we're looking back at our failures. We're looking back uh, at our sins. I, I, it's interesting. People will say to me uh, th that they don't feel worthy of one thing or another. Um, and that's, that's a, a sense of sinfulness. And perhaps a sense of sinfulness because we haven't confessed uh, and we haven't uh, received the gift of forgiveness but it's repentance and confession and forgiveness that deals directly with our past that thing that might seem to haunt us and what's wonderful is that it launches us then powerfully uh, into our future freeing us from a sense of guilt and shame and filling us with hope for the future and so that's the second thing repentance uh, is about forgiveness. Then finally, repentance is about being prepared for Jesus when it comes. Being prepared for Jesus when he comes. In fact, uh, notice again, beginning right at the first verse, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the word gospel in the Greek, euangelion, means good news. It's, this is great news. The good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the story, as the apostles preached it, in fact, when we think about the Gospel of Mark, is that the Gospel of Mark was written by uh, a young man called John Mark. In fact, he's, there's several references to him uh, in the New Testament, I think starting probably in the 12th uh, chapter of Acts. And his mother uh, had a group of believers that were meeting in his home, uh, and he was closely associated with the Apostle Peter. He went on a, a missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. And as I mentioned, he's mentioned several times in the New Testament. But um, historically, uh, in the earliest church, in the early church, uh, Paul, my, uh, John Mark, the writer of this gospel, is associated with Peter. And so what we think that we have uh, in, the, uh, in the gospel of Mark is the, is the message and the gospel, uh, the, the gospel testimony of the apostle Peter himself. Uh, 
and, and so, and, in fact, um, uh, when you, I guess the 10th chapter of Acts, you see uh, Peter preaching there. Uh, and he mentions that the message begins with the ministry of John the Baptist. And that's what we have here. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, that's John. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Make it such that when he comes, he's not gonna stumble over anything or be disrupted. He can come smooth sailing uh, into our lives. And then, um, and then uh, picking up at verse seven, and uh, John preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. And John's and Jesus in John's day, that was uh, what you would uh, have a, a hired servant do, a, a slave, if you had slaves, they were the ones who touch your feet and, un, and what John is saying, I'm not even worthy to be the, a, a slave to the one who's coming. And of course, he's referring to Messiah, he's referring to Jesus. Verse 8, I've baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. By the way, the baptizing with the Holy Spirit or giving the Holy Spirit, prophets don't give the Holy Spirit to people. That's a divine prerogative. That's what God does. And what John is saying is that the one who's coming after me will do the sorts of things that only God can do. It's interesting, you know, John is not the central figure in all of this, although we're making quite a to-do about John. He's just the messenger. He's the forerunner. He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And we know this about John because this is what he says about himself. And in other gospels, when people came and asked him, so who are you? This is the way he described himself. And he was very clear that he himself was not the Messiah, but spoke on his behalf and pointed to him. Now the central figure in all of this is Jesus, who by the way, came once before at his first advent and who will just as easily come again at his second advent. And while all of us missed the first, None of us will miss the second. We'll all be there. And the message of, message of John and the message of Advent is that we should be prepared when it does. It was Benjamin Disraeli who famously said that the secret to success for any man is to be prepared for his time when it comes. The secret of success is for a man to be prepared, a woman, to be prepared for his time when it comes. Now, we don't know exactly when it is uh, that Christ will come, but we do know that he is coming. And we know that also that it won't just be his time. When he comes, it'll be our time as well. We'll all be there. You will be and I will be. And at that moment, it will be the really the only thing that matters. Quoting again, and I close with the words of, of John the Apostle in the second chapter of his first letter, he wrote this to the uh, community of Christian believers to, to whom he was writing. He says, and now little children abide in Christ. Abide, that means stay, be in fellowship with him, close to him. Abide in Christ so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. The message of Advent, be prepared. Let us pray. This was something, Father, that Jesus himself was always saying, uh, be, be, be awake, be on your guard, watch, because you know not the hour of my coming. And this is something that we think about uh, rather in a focused manner in this season of Advent, this season of coming. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, we would be ready. Help us not just to think of it as something we have to do. 
Uh, we benefit even now uh, as we're waiting uh, through repentance and confession, being spiritually cleansed and being forgiven and having those things that would cause us feelings of guilt and shame, to have that released uh, and to us to, to find confidence and, and to, to enjoy your love and your grace in our lives uh, and, and to find that and experience it through confession and through honesty with you. And, and even so, uh, as we know, we don't know the hour of your coming, uh, that through those things we will be prepared when you come and when you come, that it shouldn't be a negative experience, but a positive one. And so as we're just here in, starting in this season of Advent, uh, we pray, Lord, you speak to our hearts. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.